So here um, we have a publication about this effort to try to make a single cell type transcriptomics map of human tissue. So you can see that this is um, from July 2021, so a very recent article. And you can see here uh, the humancellatlas.org, right? And this is something that we can actually look at. Let's try to understand because we have this capability to sequence, uh, you know, individual cells. Uh, we would like to create a reference that is a, as comprehensive as possible of human tissues. And so this particular effort is trying to create an open access atlas uh, that will allow researchers to explore the expression of human protein coding genes in 192 individual cell type clusters. And then an expression specificity classification was performed to determine the number of genes elevated in each cell type, allowing comparisons with bulk transcriptomic data, right? So there's a lot more data already that exists on bulk RNA-seq. And in this case, we would like to take these single cell data and increase the kind of specificity or the detail of this bulk RNA. And so they took, you can see here, both imaging, bulk RNA-seq, and single cell data to try to dissect all these tissues into individual types of cells that then we could reference and understand uh, specific genes that are elevated or downregulated. So let's actually take a look at this. Um, this is a uh, the place that you would go to uh, find the actual data. And you can read here a lot of the sources of the data that they uh, used. And also you can see some of the examples of the data. And the examples of the data uh, are possible to view and visualize. And so that's what we'll do today. What we'll do today is one of these collections because all of these are going to be collections of data. And let's explore what does it actually look like. So if you go with me to this second link, you can actually select many different, um, uh, many different uh, types of tissues. But let's just take a look at here specifically. What, what can we find? So when we think of types of cells, right, we typically say, okay, well, there's neuronal cells. There is... Uh, you know, oligodendrocytes, there's microglia, macrophages, etc. right? And you can see here what in reality we find, right? In reality, this type of analysis helps us increase the dimension. So for example, you can see oligo 1, 5, 2, 6, 4, 3. So there's six different types of oligo cells, right? And you can see here that, you know, if, if you actually select, they mix a lot between themselves, right? These are not clusters that are, you know, always very, very clearly defined. I mean, you can see that all of them are right here, but they're also found right here. So a lot of these types of references give us the strongest signal that we have. Not all of them are so clearly differentiated from each other, right? Some of them are, but not all of them. Okay, so here, for example, endothelial cells, um, microglia, right? But, but some of these other types, which are probably the majority of the cells, start to be more spread out and more complex, right? So the more we want to define these specific cells, we can group them into larger kind of collections of different subtypes, but also within each uh, group, this larger group, we will find more and more specific trends and patterns. Okay, so this is healthy tissue, okay? So remember, this is um, an attempt to map out all of the different cell types, different uh, bulk RNA-seq data, imaging data, and you will always see the differences in morphology and kind of the uh, different uh, phenotypic part of that data as well. But then you want to go deeper and deeper and try to understand, well, what are the differences within this, you know, big collection of cells that we call neurons, right? Obviously, there are many different types of neurons. Okay, so the next thing that we want to look at is look at some examples from disease. Okay, so here we saw these are healthy tissues. 
Now let's look at disease. So this is a collection of data that was taken from all of the you know, possible data sets that are available on tumors. So in cancer, we would like to now understand how different types of cancers, which we know are primarily um, by tissue type, right? So when you have breast cancer and lung cancer, the differences between those tumors are going to be associated with the type of cancer, lung or breast. But now we would like to understand how these cancer cells differentiate within a particular subtype. Okay, so this is again, uh, something that you can find, I'll, I'll post the links here as well. This is a project by some Chinese university uh, where they basically re-annotated, right? They collected a lot of metadata, uh, meta-analysis, sorry, of uh, data sets uh, that came from uh, GEO, from ECGA, et cetera, right? And they tried to understand, you know, again, what is the relationship between what we know from bulk RNA-seq to single cell? So again, let's take a look here at one such example. So here we'll take lung tumor microenvironment, and we'll try to understand here, what can we learn about, you know, a condition like cancer, which is a complex condition that we can actually uh, try to interpret biologically. So what I'll do is I'll go to this link. Again, on your own free time, you can explore all kinds of other uh, types of data that are available here. Uh, and you'll find that, you know, a lot of these are just collections of data sets that others have published. Okay, so here you will find a typical analysis workflow, and we will, in our second session today, learn about the different steps of analysis and how to actually perform them. But in my session, I'm going to ignore some of these basic things, and I'm going to move on to kind of like, you know, what do we learn from these collections? So again, you will find here, we have some dimensionality reduction with TSNE and UMAP. You can see that UMAP is typically going to be a little bit better making the separation greater between the larger groups. But actually, if you compare the two, uh, you know, it's obvious that both are useful. For example, here, I have a greater resolution of this mixed cluster. And here, this mixed cluster is very condensed together, right? Um, so if you scroll down, uh, let's just take a look at this chart right here. And let's see, so again, this is the tumor microenvironment. What is the tumor microenvironment? The microenvironment is like the layer between the tumor that kind of created its own hypergrowth, aggressive, this kind of like uncontrollable uh, tumor that is hurting everything, and the normal tissue, right? In between, there's this area that we call the tumor microenvironment. Typically, it has a lot of uh, immune cells, right? So when something like that happens, the natural reaction of the organism is to address it by putting their the offensive, right? And saying, let's first of all quarantine this little place and then let's kill them. And so you see here uh, T cells, uh, you can see here macrophages and, and other kinds of cells, right? And, and specifically, you can see here, if you click right here, that there's about 3% of malignant cells, right? Why is this important? Well, this is important because a typical approach for uh, treating cancer is reducing the tumor size through chemotherapy, and then trying to cut out surgically uh, whatever we can that makes that a potential for new growth, right? And so typically, that does not include all of the microenvironment because it's difficult. The microenvironment is integrated in a healthy tissue. It's difficult to separate it, but that is the problem. The problem is that you have 3% malignant cells that are inside infiltrating the tumor microenvironment. So if you think about cancer and the stages of cancer, it's all about uh, this proliferation and kind of going beyond the boundary. So containing the tumor in a well-defined boundary is stage one. And as it goes beyond that boundary, that's when your stages continue. And eventually metastasis is that they're way beyond, right, the actual environment. And so this is the problem right here these malignant cells. Now, you can see here, this is just counts of cells. If you scroll down, this is now differential gene expression, right? So now we would like to ask, well, what are the differentially expressed genes in these different clusters? So these are the different clusters. And let us try to compare them 
and identify differences between the clusters. And here's what we have, right? So these are gene, uh, gene names. These are types, or these are the clusters that we have. So let's find here those uh, um, malignant cells right here. You see, this is the malignant cells, right? So this is this cluster right here. And here we have a group of genes that are unique to this cluster, right? So we can find these specific genes and we can say, okay, whenever I look at lung cancer, let me look for these specific genes and I will be able to find some cells that are specific to this malignant type. So where do we find them here? Here, you can see I can find them malignant right here, malignant cells. So they are very different. And that is because if I could look at the tissue and say, here's the group of malignant cells. They're not going to be grouped together. They could be spread out, right? But I can now identify them. And that is very important. Okay, so this is an example. Again, we have for cancer. And you can take a look at other examples as well. Now let's take a look at another major condition. Another major condition that has been, you know, on the top of everybody's mind is SARS-CoV-2. So here's a collection again of all of the data sets that are available for um, uh, COVID-19. And I'll paste a link to this here as well. Okay. Here we can see how we are trying to map out the uh, develop disease in different tissues, right? And, and you start seeing these U maps that look like this, which is now a lot more difficult to interpret, right? Because there's so much overlap here. Uh, but essentially what we can do is we do a comparison like this. And in this comparison, we have, it's a single data set. So again, remember that there's a lot of variability in the data sets, but here is the basic approach. Let's take some COVID-19 patients, take some healthy patients, and let's try to count how many cells of different type do I have? And so what's, what stands out to you in, in this comparison right here? What difference do you notice most between these different uh, groups of samples? Who would like to uh, take a look at that and, and suggest the differences that you observe in this chart? So again, okay, so Julia is saying endothelial lymphatic cells higher. How did she get to that idea, right? Let's take a look. So first of all, we're looking at colors. Inside each color box, we have number of cells. And the colors are actually annotated down here below. So here she's saying endothelial lymphatic cells. Okay, so this is this purplish color right here is amplified in COVID and almost doesn't exist, right? Maybe right here, almost does not exist in healthy patients. You can also say the biggest difference that I observe is this orange color that is much less in COVID compared to healthy. So here, what is the orange? I go back over here, alveolar, right? So what kind of, what kind of uh, tissue is this? This is lung tissue. So what are we seeing? We're seeing that COVID-19 is killing off, right? Eliminating cells that are alveolar. Uh, you can see here expanding types of cells. So for example, red, right? So here I can see an expansion of red cells. What are these red cells? These are natural killer T cells, okay? So we, we kind of now can have a direct bio logical interpretation. Well, we know that COVID replicates in alveoli primarily, and then we see the natural killer T cells are coming and attacking them, right? And that is immediately clear from this particular study. And that's an exciting thing to see because it really confirms, you know, what we kind of know intuitively from reading these publications. We see where it's coming from. And obviously, like Julian noticed already, a lot of these uh, other types of cells have also very many differences as well, right? So now that gives us an insight into what additional questions could I ask, right? How could I think about this and expand on this, you know, basic level that I already know and start asking more specific questions? 
Okay, so these are some collections, just examples. You know, there's also a mouse uh, cell atlas. So a lot of work is done on animal models, right? So there's a lot of information about mice, a lot of information about human health tissues, some disease conditions as well. You will think the developmental aspect is very interesting as well. Development of different types of tissues, uh, development of disease, etc. cetera. 